Howdy. So the goal of this video is to talk about what kind of information do we get out of a diffraction spectra. Uh, and really we're going to focus today just on information about the crystal lattice itself, so lattice parameters and lattice angles. So in general, an X-ray diffraction spectra um, might look something like this. Basically we're measuring uh, a diffracted intensity on the vertical axis as a function of some scattering angle. Um, and so in modern diffractometers, you would have a detector that would um, move slowly through the, uh, the angle that we're trying to measure, and you're measuring intensity usually on a scintillator. Um, old school diffraction was just done with a, a strip of film. And so in this case, if you can kind of envision the film being wrapped in a cylinder uh, and the beam shining through this hole, the distance along that wrap is basically can get you um, an angle. Uh, and so people have been doing diffraction since the uh, 1900s. Um, there were a couple Nobel Prizes awarded uh, to the Braggs, father and son team. Um, but uh, the basics are very simple. All we want to do is measure intensity as a function of angle. Uh, and from this, we can, we can get basically three kinds of information. We can get a peak position. So where, what, what two theta angle uh, do I see intensity um, uh, scattered at? I can get a peak intensity. And so usually, rather than just measuring a maximum number, we integrate under a curve. So that's what this green, oh my goodness, that's what this green line is showing. Um, so each of these peaks, if you integrate under the peak, you would get some integrated intensity. So that gives us some additional information. And then finally, peak shape. So so how broad is this? Is it symmetric? Is it asymmetric? There's some information that is hidden in the shape of the diffraction peak as well. So each of those three things tells you something different. Um, and we can think about the different possibilities. So we could think about um, wanting to know something about the crystal lattice itself. So the, the spacing between lattice points and the, the angles. We could want to know something about the arrangement of atoms within that periodic unit cell. Um, so even at a very large scale, let's say a protein, if we crystallize a protein, we can run X-ray diffraction and, and determine which atoms are bonded to which other atoms. Um, we might want to know something about atomic order. So for example, for an alloy, um, are these Y and Z positions, are they separated or are they random or are all uh, atomic positions mixed up? So this is basically which atoms are sitting on which positions. Um, and then if we're growing certain kinds of materials, we want to, might want to know something about that. So for example, um, how perfect of an epitaxial film are we growing? An epitaxial film is one where we grow a particular crystal structure uh, on top of something so that the lattice parameters are continuous across that interface. Maybe we want to know something about uh, uh, average crystallite grain size or residual strain. Maybe we want to know something about if all those crystal grains are lined up in the same direction or if they're relatively random. So again, these are different examples of things that we can tell from X-ray diffraction. Uh, and each of them we basically determine from um, one attribute of that diffraction spectra. So uh, crystal lattice is basically determined um, solely from the peak position. Um, molecular structure, atomic order, preferred orientation, these are all determined from the intensity of peaks. Uh, and things like film quality and grain size, crystal strain, these are determined by peak broadening, by the shape of that peak. Um, so the rest of this video, we're really going to focus on this first box, and we'll hit these other boxes at a later point. Um, so in order to determine lattice parameters, you know, fundamentally, we can, we can pretty much ignore what's inside the unit cell for now. Um, this is not totally true. Um, we'll talk about structure factors um, later on. But for the moment being, we can ignore what atoms are where and really just focus on the lattice parameters. So uh, the lengths and the angles between the three principal lattice vectors. Um, and the way to think about this is to go back to thinking about optical diffraction. And in this case, our atomic planes are serving as the diffraction grating. So if I think about um, a set of planes in a sodium chloride lattice, maybe I have the 2OO family of planes. And so they have some particular spacing where the spacing between the planes is given by this distance. If I look at that same crystal structure, I could think about a different set of planes. In this case, it's the 2 2O. Um, the orientation of the planes is different. 
So the spacing between the planes is also different. So basically I have a few different, I have a number of different built-in diffraction gratings sitting within a particular crystal structure. Um, and I'm treating the spacing between planes as that characteristic distance um, that, uh, that is controlling the spacing between diffraction spots. Um, so a couple points, uh, any particular lattice has multiple sets of planes. So for example, I'm showing just in two dimensions, this is one lattice, but each of these colors sets of lines, so the green lines this way, that's one family of planes. The pink lines coming down this way, that's another family of planes. I have a third family, a fourth family, a fifth family. So that means that the diffraction spectra is going to have a whole bunch of different peaks where each peak is associated with one family of planes. So for example, all of these planes have the same spacing between them, um, and they're going to contribute to um, one particular peak in the diffraction spectra. Um, the, the thing that we're trying to determine at the end of the day is what is this spacing? And so I'm going to refer to this as a D spacing. Um, that's just the spacing between crystallographic planes. Each D spacing is going to re result uh, in a particular diffraction peak. Um, so Bragg's law is basically just the extension of optical diffraction to a crystal structure. Um, it's a little bit different configuration than in the optical case generally, uh, and so there's a slightly different relationship. Um, and that's just because most of the samples were not shining x-rays through the sample. Usually we're uh, bouncing x-rays off the surface and looking at the, the diffraction reflections that are coming off. Um, so this is a slightly more convenient definition, although I will say that in some samples we have the same configuration that we think about uh, with the optical case, that is where you're shining x-rays through the sample. Um, so this is the standard drawing configuration that you should think of when you think about Bragg's Law. Um, and so if we look at um, the left-hand side for a second here, these lines are representing planes of atoms, and what's labeled D, this spacing between them, so this is the orthogonal distance between one plane and another plane, uh, gives us the spacing between those planes of atoms. And so just like in the optical, um, the optical diffraction case, what we want to think about is a bunch of waves coming in that are in phase, and we want to look at the uh, additional path length and ask the question, has it added up um, to a constructive value or has it not? Uh, and if, so I can draw the full geometry below, uh, and what we're thinking about is sets of lattice planes, where again, the spacing between each lattice plane is given by D. And incoming radiation that is in phase. And we consider what is the condition under which uh, the um, diffracted beam adds up constructively. And so in order to get there, uh, what we want to do is we want to think about uh, a line that is, again, perpendicular to uh, the planes. Um, and I draw another line here that is perpendicular to the path of the beam. Another line here that's perpendicular to the path of the beam. And so this path length, the, the distance from here, oh my goodness, from here to here, or also from here up to here, um, is the additional path length. And so if I call this uh, x for a second here, the, the constraint for constructive uh, interference is if 2x is an integral number of wavelength vectors. So what is x? Well, we think about it in terms of an incident angle theta, and that angle there is the same as this angle here. And so if I know that the spacing between planes is d, and I know that this angle up here is theta, then uh, sine of theta equals opposite uh, over hypotenuse, um, or d sine of theta equals x. Um, so I can plug this directly in up here, and that gives me the expression 
2D sine of theta, sorry, of theta equals n lambda. So this is, oh, this is Bragg's law. We see it again written up here uh, without all the scribbles. Um, uh, and again, this is uh, basically the constraint that has to hold for constructive interference. Um, but, but I do want you to see the, the geometry uh, that is required uh, to get here. Um, so again, just in a practical configuration, we have a source and a beam comes in, it interrogates our sample and it comes out. And so theta is that diffraction angle uh, and oftentimes the detector, so the angle from the detector where it would be right in line with the, um, uh, the source and the angle up that the detector travels is referred to uh, as two theta. So oftentimes we plot intensity versus two theta on an X-ray diffraction spectra. Okay, so let's think about a couple examples. So if I have a lattice spacing A, um, and again, uh, n lambda equals two sine theta, what is the despacing for one zero zero planes in cubic lattice in terms of A for the one one zero and for the one one one? Um, and so again, we want to know the spacing between planes in terms of the lattice parameter. Well, uh, for one zero zero planes, uh, the answer is pretty straightforward because um, a, a one zero zero plane would be this bottom surface uh, and another one in the same family would be the top surface. So the D spacing between those is simply A. Uh, if I think about a one one zero plane, one of them would pass through here. And then I would have another one in that same family that is passing through this point. Um, and so if I draw a line that's perpendicular uh, between here and here, uh, then that should give me uh, a over the square root of two. So the lattice spacing is getting a little bit closer together. Um, and similarly, for a one, one, one plane, um, the lattice spacing should be a over uh, the square root of three. Um, So this is a general expression um, that gives you uh, the lattice spacing as a function of uh, the index of a particular plane. Uh, and this is holds just for a cubic structure. So for example, for a one, one, one plane, H is one, K is one, uh, and L is one. So this uh, whole term in here, one squared plus one squared plus one squared equals three. Um, and so basically I have three over a squared all to the negative one half power. And so that is the same as the square root of a squared over three, because it's to the negative one half power, uh, or I could rewrite this as a over the square root of three. So this expression will give you the spacing between any uh, planes for, for any, uh, any indices, so any family of planes, you can just drop the indices right in and determine the despacing. Um, it's easier for a cubic lattice uh, for a, if I skip ahead here, for other symmetries, um, that, that expression is gonna get more and more complicated. So for example, for a triclinic lattice, where A does not equal B, does not equal C, and none of the angles are 90 degrees, I get a whole mess of a expression, however, if you know your last parameters, your A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma, you can drop them in here and calculate the D spacing again for any particular peak. The other thing um, to point out is that in general, what happens to the spacing as the indices increase? So for example, think about going from the one zero zero to the two zero zero or the three zero zero. That's what I mean by increasing indices. And so as this number gets higher, again, because this is all to the negative one half power, um, the, the D spacing is gonna get smaller and smaller. 
Um, so for example, for 100, my D spacing is A. Uh, for 200, uh, my D spacing is going to be A over 2. For 300, my D spacing is going to be A over 3. So the larger the indices, the smaller the D spacing. Um, so again, this is just a different kind of an example practice. So this is a cubic structure, um, and they're looking at three different sets of planes, the 110, the 200, and the 211. For each of these, you could calculate uh, the D spacing from this expression, uh, and you can plot it in here. And if you know what the wavelength is, and again, for a, a lab-based crystallography experiment, you know what that lambda is, um, you measure the diffraction angle. So again, it's expressed in terms of two theta, but you just divide that by two. That gives you the diffraction angle. And so from each of these points, we can calculate the D, uh, the D spacing um, that's associated with them. Um, that means that we could also independently calculate the lattice parameter for a single point. But in general, we want to take all that information um, and uh, refine out the best lattice parameter that satisfies all of those points simultaneously. I think the final thing I have to say is that if we look at a diffraction spectrum, you'll see um, higher order families of peaks. So for example, if I have the 111 peak here, I see a 222 and a 333. Um, and so you can either think about those as you know um, planes that are in the same family but half the distance, or we can think about that as a higher order ref uh, refra diffraction peak. Um, so remember, generally we treat n as one, um, but you can have higher order diffraction peaks, um, and that would be giving you these basically higher order um, points up here. Same thing for the 220, I also see the 440 diffraction peak up here. Um, and so intensity will start to drop off as you go to higher order, um, but the, the spacing of those two um, basically, that's equivalent to n equals 1 and n equals 2.